I got started, of course, I, I rescued a horse when I was 12. Um, and it really stuck with me. I just, I, I took in this horse, I paid $50 for it, which was what I had in my bank account. And uh, fattened him up and got him back where he was healthy, he was just starving, and sold him to uh, a neighbor for a hundred dollars and I put that money in a coffee can for the next horse that needed help and through the years I always had my own horses but I would always find horses that people mainly had given up on because of behavioral problems and I enjoyed working with those horses and then it kind of organically went more into some medical problems and as I was aging and not wanting to get busted up anymore by, you know, it's like, I'll get on anything with hair on its back. <laughs> that, that doesn't happen. And then when I found out about the foals, it was like switching on a light. There's light and there's dark. And I realized that they really needed an advocate in their corner. They, when I started my, the rescue, it was the first independent rescue in the country, I was told. And that was 30, I don't know, 30 some years ago. <laughs> now there are a lot of horse rescues, but uh, the foals are so specific and they need so much of an eye and an expertise to get them through that first phase, the triage of, you know, that you, people don't want to do it. It's too much, it's the pressure. That's the most difficult thing about this. I'd like to say that the most difficult thing is raising the money. I'd like to say that the most difficult thing is doing the work, it's 24 hours a day. But the most difficult thing is the emotional burden of fighting with death every day to keep them alive. That's what wears on you more than anything. What is the goal for each animal? Each animal, when they come here, that's a really good question. Um, big horses, little horses, they all are evaluated on an individual basis. They all get a diet or you know nutritional supplements or a routine training whatever it is that that horse needs they receive because the ultimate goal is for them to move on I, I owned horses when I was a youngster I don't own horses any longer I'm here to help them on their journey and find the most successful permanent hopefully place so my goal is to find each horse a place where that horse belongs, where it, it suits not only its needs and abilities, but the abilities and the needs of the person that adopts it. They become partners. If you think that I, I do between 150 and 200 orphans every year, a lot of that depends on how many homes I find. Obviously, I can only take in a limited number. And if they start to stagnate here when they're ready to go, I can't take in more. In 2007, I was really stupid. I just couldn't play God. And I ended up with 41 babies in here. And it nearly killed us. I mean, financially, physically, every way you can think of. I mean, 18 of them were on IV fluids and it, you could just barely make the round of the 18 when it was time to hit them again and hit them again. Um, I, I like to keep it under 20. I designed this barn for 12, but there's more need than resources. So uh, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> it was how many have you think? Oh, think? how many? All right. So that year I did 207 babies. It's usually in the 80s, 180s um, to 160s. So between 150 and 200 foals a year for 25 years, you do the math. There's a lot of them. And big horses, uh, I used to do close to between 75 and 100 big horses a year. 
now I've, I'm just so inundated with these babies that I probably have 50 grown horses and ponies come through a year. Uh, I've just learned that I, you, the most important thing you can know in this life is what you don't know and what you can and can't do. And I can't have 10 or 15 large animals to work with when I'm working with these guys. It's like a lot of people when I had my babies. I stopped doing a lot of other things because I wanted to do the best by my children that I could. These are my children now and they're my focus. Another good question. In order to adopt, you're gonna to have to be qualified. You've gotta have horses already because they need to grow up around horses to know how to be horses. And I, I have, people say I have a lot of rules. I really don't. But all those rules are based on dead foals and problematic foals that I've seen occur. And so I established rules. You've gotta have horses and you've gotta have a significant horse background. You've got to have an appropriate facility with appropriate fences. And that doesn't mean electric wire because these guys, they run straight into solid walls. They're crazy reckless, they're babies, and they don't have a mom indicating what's safe and what isn't. So they learn, you know, they drive by braille, so to speak. It's, it's a lot of bumps. Uh, so you've got to have an appropriate facility and then you have to have a farrier and a blacksmith, which if you've got horses and you're a credible horse person, you're going to have. And they have to write a letter on your behalf. And it only takes a couple minutes. They email them generally. And it's, it can be as long or short as the vet or farrier would like, but it has to address two subjects. The level of care that your horses receive and would they recommend you to raise orphan foals? I can't be there and check everybody out all the time. I'm trying to, you know, get as many of these foals into good homes as I can. I'm gonna take the word of two professionals and I can say to them, is this what their farm looks like? Is this the kind of, because people will send me pictures of somebody else's property. Humans are unbelievably, I, I can't use the words I'd like to on the camera but uh, I, I really don't give a fig about humans too much. The biggest way in which a person can help us if they're not in a position to adopt uh, is, is to help us be able to afford to do this. I'll do the work if I've got the material to work with. And a lot of people say, well, uh, how about I buy some milk for you? It's like, no, 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 don't do that. You're gonna pay $150 a bag. Let me buy it in bulk and your money, I'll get more bang for the buck because I'm going to get a better price. Uh, money is, it makes the world go round. And all these shavings, all that milk, all the medical supplies, people that know what they're doing. Uh, volunteers are welcome, but volunteers don't know what we're doing and they don't know what that foal looked like yesterday. So uh, I've got, I have people that know what they're doing and I pay. They know how to insert a, a feeding tube. They know how to establish an IV. They've, you've got to be on the ball. So that all costs money. Um, and we do have a program for people that don't, or, or they're not in a position to adopt. They can sponsor a foal. And in sponsoring a foal, $100 that's the price I pay. I pay between $100 and $200 for each foal. And that buys a life, that $100. And when that foal, if that foal gets placed quickly, we'll turn that $100 around and go buy another life. So, I mean, it trickles out pretty quick. Each foal that comes through here at the end of the year, I actually did the math. I wish I'd never done that. It was a dumb idea. It cost me about $900 the adoption fees that are paid if i pay 100 you're gonna pay 150. i'm not losing that much i mean i'm losing eight seven hundred and fifty dollars essentially and uh, you know the, the
that we rely on the kindness of strangers, people that believe that these animals need a chance. But you can't ask somebody to pay $900 for a foal that they're then going to have to put another $500 in milk. And, you know, it's a big project. It's a big undertaking. And people aren't going to do it if you make it cost prohibitive. These foals aren't abandoned. These foals are a byproduct. Primarily, they're a byproduct of thoroughbred racing. You will only find a concentration of nurse mare farms where you have an active concentration of thoroughbred breeding. Anybody from any breed, if they have a mare that didn't make milk or the mare died, whatever, they can lease a nurse mare. But in speaking to the people that have these businesses, it's maybe one or two percent. It's it's thoroughbreds primarily, and it's there are a couple things that drive this. Number one, every thoroughbred, regardless of when they're born during a year, on January 1st, they are considered a year older. If you want a horse to be competitive at a very young age, which you do, you want it born as early in the year as possible. You're not gonna have a, a thoroughbred born in October. It's not gonna be competitive by two. All right, so you want them born early in the year. A horse's gestation is 11 months. So you've got an 11 month gestation. You want to breed her back as soon as you can. They come in heat nine days after they deliver a foal. Another rule, the jockey club, a horse, any horse that's going to race in this country has to be conceived through live cover. The stallion and the mare have to have a date. If, as a broodmare, she delivers a baby, this year's little secretariat, and she's gonna, her job in life is to produce a baby every year. And she's a, this is high-bred money horses. She's gonna have to go and get rebred. Her baby can't go with her. Insurance isn't gonna cover them for that. They aren't welcome at the breeding station. She goes alone with her set of vets. The stallion's got his set of vets and little secretariat now needs a surrogate mom. So they hire a nurse mare. The nurse mare in order to have milk, and this isn't written in stone. You can bring mares into milk if they've had foals before with a hormone therapy. But the people that own these farms can't afford to do that and they don't have the time. They do it the way their dads did and the way their grandparents did. The mare has a foal, she comes into milk. And this is exactly like the dairy business. I grew up in the dairy business. Every year, you would dry the cow up for the last couple months of her uh, gestation, and then she would have a baby and come into milk, and they call it freshening because the milk comes in heavy. The calf was taken away because the milk was the product we were after, and this is the exact same principle. However, there's not a big place in the world for baby horses. They're much more difficult than calves to have them survive. They're much more emotional, and their digestive system is brutally sensitive. If you think about it, the number one killer of horses, you know, outside of some catastrophe, is their digestive system. They colic, they die. Upset stomach, they can't throw up. It's amazing how fragile these animals are. And where that dairy calf, if it's a female, it's gonna grow up and go in the dairy business. If it's a male, they're gonna buy it and turn it into veal. Nobody wants these babies. And it was a, for the biggest part, it's been kind of a dirty little secret. Nobody, and, and I've, I've met the people that, you know, they, and they are happy to work with me because they don't want the these foals to go the other way. I work with three farms that actually care. There are many other farms that I won't deal with because they don't care. And it's nothing to them to, put down a foal. They're agricultural animals. That's the other part of this. They're agricultural animals. There are no laws to protect them as if they were companion 
and you're not going to change horses in the state of Kentucky to companion animals. That would ruin that state's economy. So it's a, it's a complex series of principles that create the need for nurse mares. If they could ship semen on thoroughbred horses, it would stop this industry. But it would take the preciousness of that sperm. And there was a horse named Stormcat. It was $500,000 stud fee. And it took him 28 seconds to do the deed. There was a book written about it called Stud, the most expensive 30 seconds in sports. That, if you had it where you could divide that up and ampules could be shipped all over the world, it would drop the value. So I don't think you're going to see that happen. Hence, it, it, all you, if, if something's wrong, if something's wrong and it's happening to animals or children or humans in any capacity or any other species, all you have to do is follow the money and it'll show you where it came from. There's always the driving force of economic gain. And that's what this is about. These foals mean nothing to the people who own the big time racehorses. What is it about horses that you love? Uh, their selflessness. They're giving, I love cows a lot too. They're like the mothers of the world. Um, uh, they don't ask a lot for all that they give us. And if, when you think about horses historically, I mean, this country wouldn't have become the country it became without the horse. Did Paul Revere come riding into town on a Hereford? No. Does Prince Charming come to your rescue on a pig? I don't think so. Do we measure power in chickens? No, it's all horses. They've got this romance and this mystique. They represent power to us. They represent the ideals of beauty and freedom. So take your pick. What's not to love? <laughs>